So I think we should just get started. And I do see that we have quite a few members of the public with us. So if you would just either use the raise your hand function or which I still don't know exactly how to do. I think it's something in participant list. You click on your name. Um, so yeah, if you are interested in making public comment tonight, just raise your hand and then I'll call on you in the order um, that you raised your hand. We have one other person in the waiting room. So well, let's start with Beth. Hi everyone, thanks. Um, I just wanted to, to give a couple of quick observations. Uh, first, I definitely wanted to say thank you to all of you. I know that the work to go through identifying individuals to answer these questions and reaching out to them and getting them to actually answer your questions is a lot of work. And so I appreciate all the time and effort that you all have put into it. Um, Last time I had mentioned the importance when doing any sort of uh, questioning of individuals about a topic, uh, having some consistency across who you're asking so that you're making sure that you're asking folks in a way that can get to the real answer you're looking for rather than to um, any biases that could be at play for any individual. And with that in mind, I had looked at the list of survey questions or questions that you all had put together and some of the responses that you had received. And it made me think back and reflect back to that comment that I made at the last meeting. Um, I think, you know, as you all evaluate these responses and you use it to inform your thinking and your recommendations to the school board, it is important to keep in mind that what you're getting is a snapshot of information and what you're getting is a perspective. Um, and sometimes depending upon where you sit, that perspective could look different. And I bring up an example in particular in mind to show you a little bit of what I mean. When I was looking at the questions and the responses, across all of the different tabs, one that came up for me was some of the questions. Um, Amanda Garces. Sorry, some of the questions and then answers from the Montpelier Police Department. Um, I think we've all seen more and more conversations bubble up to the public narrative that what we need to think about policing, we need to pay attention as community members to the ways in which police protect and serve our community. Um, and that community oversight of police is important because at the end of the day, you know, they're accountable to the people they serve, which is the public. And within the questions and responses that MPD provided, I think that perhaps there were some ways in which some of the questions were framed that didn't allow for a complete and holistic answer by the police department. And so as you go through some of these answers, I'm just asking you to evaluate and think, and use all, you know, critical thinking to think like, is the way that this question is framed going to get me to the answer I'm really looking for? For example, one of the questions asked was, has there ever been formal complaint filed um, against the police officer. As has been a both a Vermont and a U.S. conversation, um, policing has been within a certain structure for a very long time. And that structure has resulted in certain individuals who are police officers um, to get away, you know, with, with um, awful things. But it's not about the individual police officer, it's about the structures in, in the systems in which they're functioning within. And it, you know, it's important that all of us try to, try to fix and um, adjust those structures so that safety is really meaningful for all, for everyone. So when that question was framed in the way that it was, um, what it, 
unintentionally neglected was the very real uh, situation that when it comes to the ways in which policing has been set up in Vermont and in the country, what that has done is allowed for a, a cultural norm among policing that discourages individuals from filing any sort of formal complaint. Um, I have seen several instances across Vermont where people do not file formal complaints because they've been discouraged by police to file those formal complaints. Um, and if you go back to and review some of the school board testimony, especially at the beginning of the SRO topic being brought up in the summer, we actually did have public comment from people of color. And one of those um, people spoke exactly to that issue within the Montpelier Police Department, attempting to go and report something having to do with racial profiling and then being discouraged from filing a formal complaint. So um, I just, I, I, I urge you to just think about how those questions are framed and what is therefore being left out when we frame the questions in that way, knowing the, the culture of policing um, that has long been a part of our communities. And when the answer by MPD was to, to, that the SRO has not had any formal complaints filed against them, I would think bigger about the question and perhaps ask if, if there have not been formal complaints filed. Has there been a restorative justice process that an SRO or any officer has had to go through in lieu of filing a formal complaint? Um, because the impact is the same. Whether or not there's a formal complaint filed, we know that um, in Vermont, there are police officers who have um, not honored the code. And so as you look at these questions and as you discuss the questions tonight, I'd like for you to keep that in mind. There have been instances in this community with our police department where there has had to be restorative justice brought in, but formal complaints were discouraged. So just trying to like fill in the missing gaps essentially here by bringing up some of um, the, in, the inevitable uh, holes there are when we ask questions in some ways rather than in others. That's all, thanks. Thank you, Beth. Um, we are sort of finished up with, with the 10 minutes of public comment, but if, um, if there's anybody else that's here from the public that wants to comment, I haven't seen anybody do the raise hand function, but you can go ahead and unmute yourself and, and speak if you have something that you would like to say. Okay, um, so I will move on to the consent agenda, which is just the minutes from the December 8th meeting, which should have arrived along with the warning from Anna. So could I have a motion to approve the minutes or is there discussion or questions? Uh, I'll move, I think we should do the move and then second, and then if there are discussions, we'll, we do that. Thank you. <laughs> so I move that we approve the minutes of the December Eight meeting. Okay. I'll second. I'll second. Okay. Is there any discussion? All right. Um, Amanda? Aye. Mia? Aye. People are moving around in my list as I'm reading. <laughs> this is the ba a bad way to do it. Zach? Aye. Edie? Aye. Joan? Aye. Catherine? Aye. Pierre? Aye. And Jay? Aye. Is there anyone else I'm forgetting? I'm, I should have just done it based on video. Jen? Well, I wasn't there, so can I eye it still? <laughs> sure. Aye. I said aye as well. And, and Eliana, just Eliana, okay, just said I. <clears throat> All right, I think once everyone gets sort of sorted with 
If you want to put an asterisk in front of your name, if you're a committee member, then you will um, sort to the top. And then I can try to read through because some of you have your video off today. Um, all right, so the, um, the overview of tonight is that we're going to be reporting back on um, the work that we did in the past week and a half to seek answers to our questions by um, sort of the stakeholder groups. And so I think we only have about five minutes per presentation, which means like in the case of other schools, there's, you know, I think at least six other schools that we reached out to and there's four people that collected that information. So I think we're going to just have to try to give like a broad overview. And then some most of you were able to enter the answers to the questions into the spreadsheet. But if you haven't had time to do that, then please go ahead and enter whatever feedback you received over the past week and a half into the spreadsheet. And that way people can sort of sit with the information um, a little bit longer and, and sort through it between meetings. Um, so, and then we also have Libby Bonesteel is here. Um, I'm not sure if she's right here, but uh, she's gonna be prepared. Hi, Libby. Um, she has prepared a presentation for the committee based on the language of the charge and then also the questions that everybody came up with. Um, and then we've provided some time for Q&A for her after that presentation. Um, so I have, I have students going first and then I'm gonna shift to other schools because Jen needs to leave early and then hear from the experts, et cetera, and then community members and then the police department and then MRPS staff. Um, I wanted to offer the students, I'm not sure if you feel good about going first. <laughs> I know we're, I feel like we're always putting you first because that's, that was one of the agreements, but I just wanna make sure that you feel comfortable with that. Is this a, is this a, if I, if nobody says anything, then we do feel comfortable type of situation. <laughs> that sounds good. Um, yeah. Edie, Eliana, Zach, are you are you all okay with um, with presenting first, or would you rather have somebody else present first and then follow? I'm good with it. Okay. Um. So yeah, in order to try to stay on task and and um, end on time, I'm going to get started. So let's hear from the students. Well, I, I got an email. Well, me, me, I had a thumbnail of the week and it was, she had overlooked the questions and realized that like the mental health aspect was kind of left out of the students. And I feel like after, um, looking at the survey we made a few weeks ago, I didn't want to like leave behind any of those, uh, any of that feedback. And so we added a question that says, if you could allocate uh, social emotional learning, mental health conflict resolution resources within your school, what would you prioritize and what problems are you trying to solve with these priorities? And so I was thinking we could get that we could make another survey and send it out to the students that was specifically about um, mental health and especially since there's already like a million dollars in the budget dedicated to social emotional learning. And I think that really like narrow our focus in the second part of our charge where we're trying to use like restorative practices and stuff and just see exactly what the students need in regards like to that. So we didn't like, I don't know if Evie sent out an email. We, there wasn't a whole lot of communication um, with the students about uh, getting these questions done but some of them were like not really answerable by the students um, I think they were just put in this category and uh, like some of them were just uh, not really answerable like will students be harmed if the SRO position is eliminated like I just it's kind of hard to tackle some of them um, which sounds kind of like pathetic I guess well not really but um and uh is it reactionary yeah so i think we were going to send out another survey or ask um individuals about the first question on here um because yeah i don't know we just don't have that information um but yeah i just um edie did you end up doing that i just no. Um, I have not sent anything out yet. Um, I guess maybe 
all of us were waiting for somebody else to uh, communicate more about it. Um, but yeah, we did we did talk about the questions and we did find some that we thought were more about the students than uh, directed to the students. Um, so we we kind of narrowed or called, I guess, or kind of selected our questions. But I also think that um, just from Beth's comment earlier, I thought that was really important. Like we could have just like reworked the questions to make them more um, answerable. So I apologize. Please don't apologize. It's uh, I think you have a great idea of maybe refocusing together, um, rewording some of the questions to make them more appropriate to ask students to answer and then find a way to gather that information. And whether that's through a survey or maybe it's time for you to host a public forum or something like that, where the three of you, um, you know, host a Zoom meeting like this for, for students to join or something like that. We can discuss possible ways for you to provide more feedback into maybe our next meeting or the one after that. Yeah, I, I think the um, you know SEL and uh, mental health questionnaire um, is an incredible idea. Um, yeah, I think that would know, that be very beneficial for um, us as this you know team figured out. So, extra idea, Eliana. All right. Um, any questions for the students? Thank you all. Um, let's move on to the other schools. So that was Jen, Pierre, um, Mia, and myself. Let's hear from Jen first, since she's the one that has to hop off early. Okay, I'm going to um, kind of read, go, go to the chart, because I want to make sure I remember everything. Yeah, and I'll just, I'll just urge everyone to like summarize instead of, don't yeah, yeah, yeah. Just yeah. each person has about okay. a little more than a minute. Okay. All right, so I spoke to three different schools, South Burlington, Randolph Union, and Stowe, Air, Stowe area. And I focused on high schools, really. Um, so um, it's interesting, Stowe does not have a resource officer and, neither, and also Randolph does not have a resource officer. Stowe has a close relationship with um, Restorative Center, but they also have a close relationship with um, the police department and um, and the sheriff's department. So they participate in things like drills and, thing, and things like that for the school, but they don't have a resource officer at the school. Um, they do include, what was interesting to me is they included um, officers from the sheriff's department and the police department in activities at school and they consider them part of their community, even though they don't employ them. Randolph Union does not have a resource officer as well. Um, so as far as truancy, both schools handle that themselves. They send and send it right to the state's attorney, but they don't have anyone that goes to the court with a kid and advocates for what the kid needs in court. Um, conflicts in school, um, Randolph has no SRO, but they have a close relationship with two officers in the police department on text messaging, and they will call them in if there's a difficulty that needs backup. Um, and they have a good relationship with the police department, um, but they do not have anyone in the school, except for they um, do employ SRO. They do employ, I'm sorry. They do employ, sorry, they do employ the police um, for dances and all the um, sports and things like that. So um, they, and that officer is also one of the parents. And um, so because they're the parent, the kids see them a lot and they're just around in the school, not in the school, just hanging out. Okay, so South Burlington has an SRO. They have one SRO for the high school, which has 900 students. They have two, they have another SRO for the other schools and they're looking to hire a third. They have a close relationship with the state's attorney. Um, that SRO greets kids at the door. He said he has a good relationship with the kids. He spends a lot of time with outreach in the community and um, 
not, you know, I mean, he will respond if there's a crisis or anything, but otherwise that's done. That's then, how it, yeah. Uh, I just want to have you wrap it up so that we have time to listen yeah. to. Okay. Others. That's it. Uh, and also, <laughs> uh, just to point out, I'm not sure, you know, uh, the South Burlington model, because they do have SROs, the questions weren't really for schools with SROs in place. So that was an interesting, I don't know how it, how the um, cross communication, you know, happened there, but um, all right, Pierre, do you want to report out from, was it U32 and Northfield or? U32 uh, and Cross the Brook. Okay. Yeah. So I think both schools, um, U32 has never had an SRO. Um, so their premises of everything, that foundation for um, just safety in the community is more, uh, it starts with relationship building. That's the foundation. Uh, and within those relationships um, with families and, and community, um, you know, they build teams um, to work on um, different things. So, um, you know, mental health is one, restore, they have a huge restorative practice, um, I guess, lens um, in that community. Uh, and there you use a lot of circles um, to really talk about issues, you know, um, but if there's like any huge, huge problems, basically, they obviously use the state police, um, but that's something that they haven't had to use um, in a long, long time. Um, but they have a huge mental health team um, that have been together for a long time. Um, and they're really, um, I guess, strong, um, the assistant principal said, um, and they you know work really well together. So their foundation basically is just building a relationship with students and, and community and the families. And it, you know, they're really good about if they you know see like a student struggling early on, um, they connect with those students, um, you know, in, in ways that they help them out basically. So you know, home visits and things like that basically. So the schools um, and the community, they kind of consider themselves one community, um, even outside of the school. Crossbrook. Um, they had the Waterbury PD, but apparently the Waterbury PD um, ceased to exist now. Um, so they had like a school resource officer, uh, but now they do not. Uh, the last two years, um, the town itself decided to um, discontinue the police department there. Um, so same thing, same model. Um, you know, their their model is more um, you know the PBIS um, restorative practice model. You know, um, really just getting building that foundation for kids to really you know, understand, you know, we have responsibility for being responsible, um, being respectful, being safe, being kind. Um, and then again, reaching out to community for any issues that may be, but they also have a, a huge mental health piece, um, you know, um, team and, and lens. Uh, and they've been really, um, you know, oh, and they also work with, I'm um, sorry, mental health agencies um, outside. So Washington County Mental Health is really, really big, big involved in that school, so. Great, thank you, Pierre. Uh, Mia, do you want to report out? <clears throat> sure. So I will first apologize. I dropped the ball on reaching out to Barry, um, but I'll get back on that. Um, the When I reach out to the Vermont um, Superintendents Association, um, the Jeff Francis, the executive director there, was um, uh, supportive of the process that we were going through and said that the best avenue to get um, get responses from the resources available within the, the this association is for is for us to have uh, have Libby go and and essentially network through the uh, her fellow superintendents. So if there are specific questions that we really would like superintendents to answer, um, it's something that we could ask Libby to, to go to them for. Um, and the other person that I checked in with uh, is Tina Muncy, who uh, used to be a member of the board of directors, our school board of directors, and uh, was also a principal at a K through eight school. And um, overall, her, um, her uh, I don't know, approach, I guess, could be summarized by saying that administrators and um, the mental health and social work supports that are at school um, could definitely handle the particular intricacies of what an SRO does in, in terms of um, guiding a student through, um, you know, truancy court, if that was the example. Um, and she also brought up a really good question about um, what is community involvement? How is our community holding each and every one of our kids um, and seeing this as something that we do together? Um, I thought was a really um, uh, a good question for us that she raised. Great. Um, I'll, I'll try to be really brief. I just, um, I would really recommend that people read through the answers, um, particularly in this section, because I think the value um, of, of listening to schools who have built systems in the absence of an SRO 
it is really an important perspective. And when I was having these conversations, they were very in-depth. They took a long time. There was great answers, but we obviously don't have time to report out on everything. So I definitely would encourage people to go back through and read the full text of the answers. Um, my big takeaways, I talked to a Northeast Kingdom school and I talked to a Bethel area, area school and the Northeast Kingdom school and the Bethel area school both um, talked about the truancy piece. There was a question about truancy and home visits and they both sort of said, you know, we've never felt uncomfortable doing a home visit. And if we did feel uncomfortable or unsafe or felt like we needed a police officer present, we would take a big step back and ask, why are we going to that house? And that if it was a safety issue around um, an adult that was dangerous in the house, then probably the police should visit on their own to the house. And that if it was a question of safety of a child that was at stake at the house and, and the school was worried about that child, that they would work through DCF and have DCF do a home visit. Um, they both said that they would invite parents to come to a neutral place um, if there was any sort of friction with that family and they wanted to do a home visit around whatever concern they had, they would either invite them to come to the school or meet at a neutral place um, in public. They both, um, but in particular Bethel schools have built a really innovative system around restorative justice practices. So I think it could be something that we could look into, but because of their proximity to the Vermont Law School, they've partnered with a group there that help them do restorative justice practices. Um, so, you know, much like we do with the Community Justice Center, they sort of, cert, you know, certain things that sort of rise to the threshold of maybe needing involvement or there's criminal activity involved or whatever, they would, you know, they do call the police, but that they would work um, through com these community justice models that have been built. So anyway, really positive conversations. I would definitely urge you to read through the full text of, of the answers. Um, so let's move on to experts, et cetera. That was Will, Jim, and Mia. I did not hear back from the Vermont Humanities Council, so I'm gonna not report back on that today, but we can start with Will. Hello, everyone. Sorry I'm late. Um, let me pull up what I found. I had two um, really good, really positive and comprehensive um, expert conversations. The first with James Lyall, um, the executive director of the ACLU of Vermont. Uh, we talked on the phone. Um, I put direct quotes are in the, are, are in the form. Um, I was typing this up while we were talking. Um, so these, he had, um, with the caveat that he's not himself an expert in alternative models, um, but it sounds like talking to the schools that have those currently working is a much better thing to do anyway. Um, my, the general takeaway um, is things we already knew, frustrations about the lack of specific data in Vermont, but there's a tremendous amount of data nationally um, that he pointed me to. Um, and there's a consistency in terms of the disproportionate impact on students of color, students with disabilities and LGBTQ students. Um, he cited a study called Kicked Out um, that the Vermont Legal Aid conducted in 2015. It is not specifically about SROs, um, but it's one of the few relevant studies recently conducted in Vermont. Um, it does list um, statistics uh, collected federally on um, not SRO related incidents, but um, referrals to law enforcement by the schools and demographic information on um, who is most impacted by that. And uh, let's see, I'm sorry, just glancing over my notes quickly. Um, the big takeaway, so something he repeated several times was that um, many of the questions, um, there, there were a whole chunk of expert questions that together amounted to who will do all of these specific things that SROs currently do. Um, and they list various specific things. Um, and what he kept saying to each of them was that um, the involvement of SROs is relatively recent. Um, the same 
the same people who did um, who did that work before we started um, passing that work off to the police um, would presumably take it up again. And his understanding was that there's there's no reason that assistant principals, guidance counselors, school administrators, um, school nurses um, couldn't return to doing that kind of work. Um, as they did before, I had a similar conversation with um, Rebecca Plummer of Vermont Legal Aid of Montpelier. Um, and I asked a new question of her. I added a new question down at the very bottom. Um, that was just what resources, local or national, do you consider required reading for anyone charged with this work for evaluating the SRO role? Um, she listed three things, two of which I already knew about. One was the same kicked out study that the Disability Law Project of Vermont Legal Aid conducted in 2015. It's about a 40 page PDF. Um, and it's not that long because half of those 40 pages are pictures. Um, and it's online. I put the link in there. Um, so she cited the same one that the ACLU cited. Um, also, Vermont Legal Aid recently developed a myth and fact sheet that's very brief. It's two pages long um, about the SRO role and what um, com common beliefs and what the studies have, have thus far determined to be true. Um, that is online um, and Rebecca sent me the link. So I've got that at the bottom of column E in the same form. Um, she also cited the open letter to all superintendents and school boards that was sent out by the Disability Law Project um, June 23rd of this year, which I believe has already been shared with all of us. So those three things, those were the specific resources that she said um, were absolutely required reading for, for this body. Um, she also said she, um, like the ACLU, she um, mourned the lack of specific data um, in Vermont. Well, um, I need to ask you to wrap it up because we would need to stay on a timeline, <laughs> sorry. All right, she said, um, she encouraged us to extrapolate that we, that Vermont, Vermont is not a different universe or a different dimension from the rest of the nation. And that she encouraged us to extrapolate from national data available and not to assume that Vermont is um, immune from the same forces. And I want to make, can I make a comment there? Um, great work, William. Uh, I think the only thing I'm concerned about is, you know, I think you, you mentioned that, you know, um, one of your um, people you talked to said that, you know, um, that role of the assistant principal, um, principals, nurses, and, and, you know, guidance counselors or counselors um, could be able to take the role over the SRO. You know, my concern there basically is that, you know, you know, even like 10 years ago, the role of the SRO in the schools, you know, we're new, um, but we're asked to do more with less now. Um, so, you know, what administrators are doing in the school, like officers and, and, and I guess we call the resiliency teams um, are a lot different now. Um, again, we're charged with doing a lot more in schools, and so to kind of take on the added responsibility of, you know, like, you know, SRO duties, basically, is, right. you know, is worth the time. I mean, like, you know, like each day, basically, you know, like each day I go back to work, basically, there's more things going on. Our nurse, you know, has more things going on. Our, our you know, social workers have things going on. So, you know, I, I guess we have to be careful with saying that, you know, hey, you know, the assistant principal or the principal and, and the, you know, um, mental health team can kind of take that on because that's not, Accurate. We cannot do that. I'll be honest with you. So but thank you very much for that. Yeah, and Pierre, like your point is sort of echoing what Beth sort of testified at the beginning is that we really can only take these as a snapshot in time from that one person's perspective. And so I think we all need to be listening to all of this with um, a critical eye and then and knowing that future committee work can sort of delve deeper into these discussions and do more of like a back and forth point by point what's realistic, what's not realistic type of examination. But let's just try to get through the initial, sorry. Uh, Mia? Yep. Um, just just to piggyback just for one second off of that, I um, think that I, it's helpful to remember that what we are examining is the possibility of undoing systems that have been in place for over a decade. And that is challenging to think about. Um, and so that's, that it's, you know, really wonderful that we are muddling our way through all of this. Um, and uh, that's a, just a, 
another variation of that same theme of like, these are really just, these are all um, different data points that will help guide us. Um, and the, just to now to get to the responses that I received, um, I never got anything from the guardian ad litem where I reached out, referred me to someone who I haven't heard back from yet. So I will keep trying on that. And then uh, I reached out to an acquaintance who is an attorney at the Defender General's office. Um, she wanted to make very clear, she's also a parent in the district. Um, and she wanted to make very clear that these are her um, expressions that are based on her professional experience uh, and not exact, not representative of the Defender General's office. Um, I just would, rather than go through all of them, of course, I just wanted to highlight that she offered um, a really good model that we could start from as a, as a base point of examining what, what it might look like um, that was offered by Dignity in Schools. Um, so I think that's just one big highlight from, from re those responses. And I encourage everyone to read through the notes. All right, great. So um, Jim is not here to present uh, from his uh, organizations that he reached out to. So let's move on to community members, um, Joan, Will, and Catherine. Um, I think we probably could just each take like a minute. I think we have five minutes total. Um, from what it looks like in the notes, I did the work of um, maybe others did as well, looking back at the um, school board meetings going back to July 1st and trying to summarize some of the public comment. Um, so our we just had one question um, to look at, which was um, sharing experiences from community members and students. The question was framed as who have been referred to the SRO, especially in particular from our people from marginalized communities. And we talked about as a committee in the last meeting about expanding that a bit, not just to people who were actually referred, but who may have had any kind of interaction um, with the SRO. So in the, the portion of the work that I did, which was just looking back at the school board meetings, there were several, um, there were lot. There was lots of public comment, and there were um, four or five that, especially in particular, shared um, you know personal stories um, of uh, experiences people had had um, in response to the SRO and police in general in Montpelier um, that were shared, and um, you know people. Um, I think, again, it's worth looking, you know, looking back at the meetings. Um, and um, in general, you know, it, it sort of covered the range of um, the SRO not being particularly helpful to all the way to really feeling uh, and being um, harmed in the experience of and traumatized and experience of um, trying to rectify a situation um, with the police department. And, um, and people shared uh, the feeling of um, being fearful in the presence of an armed officer um, on, you know, on school grounds. Uh, there was a parent, you know, who commented on the uh, SRO being on the Union Elementary School playground um, to, um, you know, mother of two black students in the high school uh, who shared their, you know, fear and um, discomfort being around an armed officer. Um, and then um, there was a very detailed um, experience shared um, of a student of color. It was the parent who shared, um, but of experience of a student of color who was attacked at the library um, and, you know, the family tried to address the situation and were dismissed um, and definitely did not have a positive experience. Um, and so that's what I gleaned from the um, public comment. Um, and I think Will and Catherine uh, had some more antidotes that they also collected. Catherine, you wanna go first? 
Sure, I'll just be very brief. Um, I did reach out to several people that I knew had specific interactions with the SRO, mainly at the high school level, um, and got a couple of responses that you can see in the um, in the, on the spreadsheet. Um, and basically, with those um, people in difficult situations, that um, I think you can read that. They were um, maybe, you know, scared by the situation um, uh, and one in particular terrified of the idea of having to talk to the police and the, the SRO being involved, being a, making it more of a positive experience because that relationship was there. Um, and then um, there were just a couple of people that I reached out to that, that still haven't given me anything, but I'll continue to try to get more information. It's a little bit difficult. Um, these are really personal sensitive situations that people may not want to relive or, you know, tell even anonymously. There may be identifiers. Um, so I think it's just a, a sensitive topic to try to get personal experiences. So. Ditto to that. This is um... Um, difficult work to, to do, difficult information to get, difficult to summarize without identifying information. Um, I, I heard a few anecdotes. They're summarized on the forum. The most serious one, um, there's a general takeaway that I got from, from all of them taken together. The most serious um, one that involved an SRO directly was at the elementary school. Um, and um, and I find it interesting in particular because the seriousness had nothing to do with the SRO conduct. Um, and the SRO also was not involved in any, um, making any disciplinary decisions, but they were used um, a few years ago by the former principal of the elementary school, um, specifically to intimidate an elementary school student who, um, there was an incident with carving a swear word into the principal's desk and um, what happened then was a meeting called with the parents um, and the child and the student. They were very surprised to find the SRO in the room. Um, and, and eventually the mother was in shock. The father said, eventually asked, why are the police involved in this? Um, at, at which point the SRO took him aside to comfort him and say, don't worry about it. Um, I'm, they just asked me here to scare him a little bit. So that indicates um, a use by the school administration to, to use the SRO specifically as a tool of intimidation. Um, and that of course la would land very differently depending on who that student is. Um, and by all accounts, the conduct of the SRO was exemplary. They did nothing, they stood there. That, um, that moment stuck out for me in the stories I heard. Um, my one takeaway from all the other stories, which I won't get into or summarize here, is they taken together, they indicate significant inconsistency in terms of whether or not an SRO is involved. Um, sometimes they are, sometimes they're not. That seems to be arbitrary. That seems to be dependent on whoever happens to be on call at the time of the incident. Um, and the SRO is not always involved from that moment forward, even if the incident occurred on school grounds um, and involved current students. So this, um, and I think that's significant because that's part of, um, part of the importance of the role that we keep hearing is that the SRO is always present and available for that kind of consistent work. That doesn't appear to be the case from the stories that I've heard. Um, and I would also like to respond to Pierre, but that would be a digression. So I will understand if Emma would rather I not. We might have time for digressions later. Let's see okay. where we end up um, after everyone has presented. So um, I think I'm next for the Montpelier Police Department. Uh, and I will, I kind of forgot to mention this at the beginning of the meeting and I apologize, but Chief Pete is here to help answer any questions that arise from um, my presentation of his answers. And then also he has offered to um, potentially fill the seat of 
Tony, who was who had to step down, and that ha is yet to be determined. It's going to be um, discussed at the board level about um, whether the seat should be filled or how. And so we haven't made any um, formal appointment yet, but uh, Chief Pete is at least here to listen. So thank you for being here, Chief Pete. Um, so again, so much information and such a great conversation that I had um, with Chief Pete over the weekend, and he provided really thorough answers to all of the questions. So I would definitely recommend going back through and reading through all of them. Um, I'll just give you sort of the quick, the quick uh, summary. Let me just get to. There was a question about um, complaints. So Beth mentioned that at the at the start of the meeting in public comment, and there were there has been not no formal complaints. So I think it is important to stress the word formal. We're not really sure, and I don't know if there's data collected about other types of complaints that were handled differently. But no formal complaints on record about um, the SRO. And the there was a question about whether the SRO could potentially be unarmed. And the answer is sort of an unequivocal no, that, that the police department would not support a model where a police officer is in the school without a weapon. Um, there, there is a question about data and there's just not a lot of data collected. Um, I'm sort of working with Chief Pete to try to figure out what we are able to look at and what makes sense for the committee to see. And I will just quickly screen share what I have and I've put it into the spreadsheet. So you are welcome um, to take time to look at all of that. So he was only able to give me basically the calls that were made to the three buildings in the district. So One Park Avenue, um, Union School, Mainstream Middle School and the, and the high school. So for the past five years from 2016 to present, all of the calls that were made. And so you can sort of, I mean, it is interesting to look through, um, but you know, we just started talking about like, what does alarms burglary mean? Because this was one of the big categories of, of why people were called to the, the police were called to the buildings. And that could run the gamut. You know, it's sort of, sort of like with all of these categories, you wouldn't know any more information until you like delve deeper into the incident report. So there's not, you know, I'm not sure how useful the data is. And we, we as a committee can maybe look through it and, and see if there's something we can glean from it. Um, but so alarms burglary, for example, could be anything from like the alarm tripping or somebody entering the building by accident, or it could be actual, you know, somebody trying to break into the building. And we just don't know by looking at just alarms burglary. So I've sorted out on the spreadsheet by, by school. So you can see like uh, Montpelier High School, MSMS, um, Union School, and then I have all the data together. And then what I did was I did the call type and um, sort of did the research of the number of calls per year and the number of calls total for based on those call types. So there was five total dog animal problem calls in the past five years. That's a total of one per year. Um, so I created a couple of charts from the data that you can look at. And again, I'm not going <laughs> to uh, sort of attest to the validity of, of any of this, but it's just sort of a good like at at a glance, um, alarms burglary was 28%, traffic stops was 9.6%. Um, there was an other category where if there was an incident that only happened once or twice, less than five times, I just added it together in this category. Um, and the gra the gra this is a chart of number of calls per year by call type. So you can kind of look through there and see what some of the major calls are. Um, this was, I also did the number, the, the same type of graph for calls per year. And then the other data, which we're sort of, uh, Chief Pete and I are looking into, and I'm not even sure if it will be helpful, but there was some question about response and who will respond and how often does the SRO respond versus other officers. So this was the, the officer badge number of responses for the past five years. And this is, um, I think I'm going to have to ask Chief Pete to get on, but I think 814 is the SRO. And I was wondering if, Chief Pete, do you know, is 808 also like the previous SO, SRO? No, actually 807 is the SRO. 807 is the SRO. Okay, because there was SRO activity was listed under badge number 814. So that would be, that. there's a, there's a, well, it depends on the date range on there. So the context is all, this is. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I was saying in the beginning, no one's, the context is different. So it depends on the context of the question. I can probably give you a more appropriate answer. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, it's just, it, you know, you can see that the calls are pretty spread out across officers just at a glance. So we can work with Chief Pete to figure out, like, if there's something that we want to know from the data, if, um, if there's a better way to go about that. I did reach out to the Community Justice Center, which was something that Chief Pete recommended doing. And um, I think they do ha- keep some amount of data of how many cases are referred to them through you know, the restorative justice practice, but they didn't have that available for this meeting. Um, so the role of the SRO, that was a question that was asked in primary. It's to, the primary role is to ensure safety of students, staff, and visitors to handle any law enforcement um, on school grounds, do school crisis planning, be a liaison for school officials, help deal with truancy issues, Uh, provide mentorship and training, and then provide that connection between the Community Justice Center. Um, The SRO also helps to refer, there was a question about arrests in school, and they said that's one of the primary goals of the SRO position, that they're trying to avoid arrests, and so they really try to, um, the SRO in particular tries to push cases to the Community Justice Center. What types of crimes vandalism, sex crimes, domestic violence, narcotics, tra- I mean, it sounds like thefts, it sort of runs the gamut. Um, and I think Libby's gonna present a little bit on that later too. Um, and there was a question about training and I was, you know, uh, Chief Pete provided a pretty in-depth explanation of the types of training that um, his officers are sent to. So I'm gonna give just a minute, Chief Pete, if there's anything that you would like to add to what I just said. Oh, no, I appreciate it. Appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, just uh, if there are any questions uh, that I can answer for the group, I'm more than willing to do it. I think we can pro- provide a couple minutes if people do have questions. I also think we need to think of this as like a longer term goal too, because there's some of these questions, you know, I feel like we could write a master's thesis or doctorate on the Montpelier Police Department role with the Montpelier uh, Roxbury School District. So it's, we're not gonna be able to cover everything, but if you have a quick question, we can make a few minutes. Thank you for being part of the conversation. It's good to be here. Um, I would also like to echo the gratitude for having you here, Chief Pete. Um, A question that has been coming to me over the last week or so is particularly around this avoidance of arrests of students, um, which I think is laudable. And I'm curious what it might look like for any police officer to have that approach and orientation toward students or youth in general, um, essentially saying like the process that the that the SRO has been following for however X number of years, almost to me feels like a pilot program for how we can be orienting ourselves toward toward juvenile behavior. And would it be possible to learn things from how the SRO approached that and apply that to the force more broadly? Okay, uh, that's a good question. Um, but uh, the entire department has that same focus. It's not just the SRO, it's the culture within the Montpelier Police Department as a whole. I'd also argue it's, in, it's a culture within uh, within the, the judicial system within the state. And I think it's enforced by um, by the judges themselves. So, I mean, even even if, one, if officers wanted to go out and, and this is way not even the truth, but I'll just go way to the other perspective. If officers, if you had an officer that wanted to respond to everything by just arresting people, uh, it, th- those things wouldn't even probably, charges probably wouldn't even be approved um, by the state's attorney's office. So there's, there's, a, there's a ton of safeguards built in. Um, the, the, the judicial system, the state's attorney's office, um, it's, again, this is, uh, I want to, again bring in a context that it's not just the Montpelier Police Department there's there's a lot of things that are going on and but but to answer that question the it's, it's the culture within our department to to avoid uh, putting people or to arresting people I will echo a little bit of what Mia said though because I did hear oh Amanda you raised your hand <laughs> um we'll get to you next um in my conversation with the um, Community Justice Center, and it was the prior, um, it was someone who has who just recently retired. 
Um, but her perspective was that there was a little bit of discrepancy between, you know, from officer to officer, that it wasn't totally cohesive, like there's not a definite protocol. Um, and some of the programs that you referenced in terms of like statewide programs to avoid courts for kids, um, she was talking about that as like diversion and those types of alternatives. And that her preference would be to keep kids completely out of even that level of, um, of court system and just and have the default be the community justice center. So there was, you know, I think it's um, still an interesting point and conversation to be had. Amanda? Yeah, thanks. Um, hi, Chief Pete. Um, so in some of my conversations with the school social workers and school counselors, um, one of the valuable parts of having the SRO is, is that they're so tied to our families and the community and what happens to our students maybe um, that we wouldn't know about in the community and that information is really important domestic violence or if a student ran away the night before. Um, so if we didn't have the SRO, my question is, it, are the, can the police share that information with schools knowing that our students are affected? Um, I'm just curious if that's something that you're allowed to do. Oh, you're muted. I I think it. I think it depends on the context of, of, of again of, of the issue. So, and then it, then it's also an issue of time as well. So we don't have somebody first and foremost that would be totally dedicated to, um, hey, we know this is going on in the schools. Funnel this information to this person. Uh, you know, to to compile all this information to pass it along. When when and when asked for it, depending on the context of what the issue is. And then, then most definitely, we we do our best to be partners. We have a very strong partnership with the school system. So, um, but as far as like the intimacy, I mean, I would imagine that if you, I would compare it to whatever career field everyone here has, and that the more you have a tight relationship with the, you can pick up the phone and you can dial somebody, and you can you can get a good answer and an answer right then and there when you need it. It's not that they don't want to give it to you. It's just that you have a level of access, you have a level of a relationship and a level of trust in which that you're able to share information uh, and to move forward. So I would liken it to that. Thanks. Um, Will? This, oh look, I'm unmuted already. Um, it, chief, this question comes from um, a brief conversation I had with the former Chief Fakos in um, our previous meeting, but it was in a breakout room. So it wasn't part of the larger thing. We, we briefly shared our mutual um, dissatisfaction with the current memorandum of understanding between the district and the city. Um, and the facilitators have charged us with finding things that we can all agree on. Um, so I, I just wanted to read to you um, half a sentence from the purpose philosophy statement um, and to confirm as your predecessor did that this is not in fact the central purpose and philosophy of the SRO or the department. Um, it says, it is logical that if the outward symptoms of antisocial behavior, juvenile delinquency are discernible at the school level, it is appropriate to implement a program aimed primarily at prevention of this behavior, um, which is an alarming statement um, and one that um, the, the document you yourself provided us um, did, is, seems to run directly counter to in a way that I very much appreciate that the role of the SRO is not to be surveilling the students for potential symptoms of future juvenile delinquency and to intervene in some way, which um, seems like a terrible recipe for profiling. Um, so um, I suppose, I'm sorry, I suppose my question is, um, do you agree that this statement is in serious need of up updating in some fashion? Uh, I'd say, I don't know the context and who wrote it, who wrote it or the context and what it was written. I would choose my words differently than the, something like that. I don't think anybody knows that. Um, the Chief Eko said that he had never seen it in his 30 years of- it, But it, to it, be it, clear, you're quoting the current memorandum of understanding that's on file between the city yeah. or between the school district and the police department. This is the standing agreement. Yes. I think everyone can agree it's in need of updating. I, I don't think anyone disagrees with that premise. 
I've heard I've heard that from multiple people. Um, Eliana. Um, I was looking around and it says that the state of Vermont has wired implicit bias training for um, the Montpelier Police Department. And I read a bit of your statement about that, but I was just wondering if you could speak to what that training um, looks like. I'm sorry, what was the question again? I could barely understand. I could barely hear you. I'm, I'm old. Um, if you could just speak to the implicit bias training that's required in the department. I'll help rephrase. So I don't know if you heard it, Chief Pete. Did you hear it that time? The, if I could speak to implicit bias training for the Montpelier Police Department. Yeah. So she had she had researched somewhere that um, that the Montpelier Police Department provides implicit bias training for their their officers, and she wanted to hear more about that. Okay. That I that that I don't. I'm not prepared to answer that question. I'm not too sure what implicit bias training look like here. Um, I, I could tell you what, what I would do is how I look at implicit bias training is not, um, to me, it, it's, I don't believe in trainings. I believe in conversations because it, the more that people can understand where each other's coming from, the more that I think you can get something out of it. So th there may be, and again, I don't know my peers, but um, I don't know how, how Vermont is doing it. I haven't researched that yet, but to me, I, I'd rather, you know, it's easy to check off a box and say, hey, here's implicit bias training and, and this is what this respective community group is like, this is what this respective community group is like, and then to, to have, like, I guess, some of the do's and don'ts of dealing with people. And in the beginning, uh, when, when police agencies were implementing things like implicit bias training, that's what it was. And, and, and it's not that the departments created that training, it's they went out to other places to get that training. Like, for example, if you go to the ADL, uh, the Anti-Defamation League, they have certain trainings that they can do with human with implicit bias in certain areas in certain regions of the country. So it's, it's so to me, those types of conversations aren't effective. I think it's something that's more along the lines of, of, of understanding each other and having honest conversations and dialogue that we humanize each other. And that's when it, that's when that, that training takes hold. So um, I apologize, I, I'm not, I, I don't know how to answer that question right now. I can definitely research it and get back to you. But um, as far as what my, how I look at it is, is, is basically immersion, trust and, uh, and being around each other and, and valuing each other. So Chief P, if you could look into like the specific, the actual training or whoever you contracted with for that training in the past and just email that to me and then I can email it to the committee. Okay. Thank you. So Beth, I'm gonna ask you to hold your question for a little bit and then um, I think I'm gonna be able to open it up to public comment a little bit later. Um, we have a tiny bit of time here and I wanna get to the, um, the staff feedback. So Amanda? Yeah, um, I didn't have a ton of time, uh, unfortunately, but I did talk to briefly um, the school counselor and social worker at both um, Main Street Middle School and the high school. And Susan, who's not here today, she talked to the school counselor and social worker at the, uh, at the elementary school and the nurse at Roxbury. I reached out to the guidance counselor at Roxbury, I never heard back from her. Um, so you guys can read my notes specifically, I'll be quick. Um, I, I think at least from talking to the middle school and the high school, it was really clear that um, they really um, miss the role that, not the role, the person, and this is a really important, um, important point. Um, they all talked about Matt Nisley who was the former SRO and his skill set and what he brought to the teams uh, and the schools and the students. But they also acknowledged it's not that they were referring to the person and not the role. And I think it's important to say they wouldn't want the current SRO to be in their school and working with them. So I think that's a really interesting um, point to make that what Matt Nisley brought to them um, was his trauma training and his de-escalation skills and his resources of the community and his gentleness and how familiar he was with families and how well he worked with teams at the school. So I just thought that was a really interesting takeaway for me was, um, was that point. And um, 
they just spoke to like, we want more of those skills. Um, and that would be really great. Um, so what else? And I guess also like a concern about, especially at the high school, um, we work with bigger bodies and when they get, when people, when students get violent, which doesn't happen often, um, we need somebody to intervene. And the concern is if we don't have a relationship with the police or like who is good, which police officer is gonna respond do we trust them and that they have the skills and know our students well enough how to de-escalate the situation? Um, yeah, I guess so that, that was sort of the concern about was who the relationship, because we are gonna call the police from time to time, um, unfortunately. Uh, I think, I feel like I'm missing stuff. While you're looking through your notes, I'm just going to quickly add on the, um, the conversation I had with the Community Justice Center person, uh, also commended Matt Nisley for having, he had his master's in conflict resolution and mediation, yeah. so I think that might be what you're referring to, like a, a very specific skill set that he was able to bring to the table that not every officer has. Absolutely, that, and he just had a really, the way he de-escalated, he had trauma training um, that I think went above and beyond potentially what the police have for their training is what it sounds like. I don't know for a fact, it would need to be, maybe Chief Pete knows, but um, yeah, I think, I think that like sums it up. Um, yeah. I'm sure I'm missing something, but go back and read my notes. <laughs> Amanda, when I was reading through your notes, yeah. uh, the, the common theme that kept popping up is, is home visits. That was one yeah. thing that I kept seeing. Yeah, so that, right. So at least for the middle school and the high school, there are home visits that are done and um, they're typically done, like they're like a wellness check. A lot of times it's if we haven't heard from students and not even from the parents and we're really worried, like no, like really worried. So um, typically the social workers will go. Um, they don't like to go alone. So um, going with Matt Nisley has been really helpful. Um, the middle school social worker said she would go alone if she had to, she'd prefer to go with somebody else, but she wouldn't wanna just go with some random police officer that she didn't know because she wasn't sure how they would react, how they would, would act in that situation. She knew Matt really well, so she knew um, to trust him. So it was really like building that relationship and that trust. So she, she had said she'd rather just go alone. Um, and then another point, which I thought was really interesting from a social worker at the high school who said, you know, why doesn't the high school have, or why doesn't the school district have a say in who's hired for this SRO position um, with the skills that we're looking for in the school district? And, and it's the police department that, I know that they're employed by the police department, but we're, they're also working for the high school, or for, not sorry, I keep saying high school because I work at the high school. Um, for the school district. So really saying like, if we are gonna continue with an SRO, why doesn't the school have more of a say in who's hired? Thank you. Yeah. Um, for pointing out what I missed. <laughs> um, I, I did want it, there was, there was one thing that I sort of forgot to present about my other school feedback and it actually touches on that home visit piece um, because one of the guidance counselors that I spoke to um, it was just a complete paradigm shift for them to consider the possibility of having a police escort to a home visit. It was just something that, you know, it's not something that they ever consider. So they never go alone. They bring either the principal or the superintendent or, you know, another guidance counselor with them. So they do go in pairs. But the big point that they, they talked for a while on was sort of like they were pondering and considering I wonder what the presence of a police officer, how that might shift the dynamic, because um, they talked about, you know, building trust with kids and families, and that if they arrive with a police officer in tow, that that probably has, will shift that dynamic and could erode trust with the families. Um, and then back to that point of like, well, if I really felt in danger, I'm not going to go to a home visit. And so, um, you know, and that they would still could still call police to go visit a home, but just on their own. Um, is there anything else that's sort of like, if, if anyone wants to use the hand raise function, if there's something else that you've been sort of pondering as people are presenting, um, and there's a few last words that we want to say, and then we'll get to Libby's presentation. Emma. 
if I may, I, mm -hmm. I, um, I don't know how articulate this is going to come out, but I just want to say like, after having listened to all of these things, I, this just, it's a lot. It's a lot. And I, <clears throat> maybe this is piggybacking off of what was said in the public comment, but just seeing all these different pieces of information really underscores for me that it's really important that we not weight any one of the pieces of information significantly over the others, but instead that, and I think it can get very easy to get lost in data and, and lost in, um, especially as we try and problem solve. And so I just wanted to encourage all of us to, to stay, stay big picture, at least at this point, we're still at a big picture phase and to be comparing the whole of what we are hearing and taking in and, and, and reading with the broader vision of like really ultimately what is best for the students and teachers and staff in our in our district. And I recognize that in order to answer that, we all bring our own biases. And that's one of the reasons that we have this information and the information <laughs> is coming from bias sources. And it just, it's, that's probably this, the heaviness and the, and the weight of what I'm feeling. So one, I just wanted to say thank you to all of my fellow committee members for, for really wrestling with this stuff and encourage all of us to keep the big picture in mind. And, and, and that will allow us, I think, to think what's possible because undoing what is currently in place is, is very difficult. And, um, and so it's hard to imagine what else could we do? How else might we do it? And, and, and I think by stepping back and taking the, keeping the big picture in mind, like what is truly in people's, in our best interests for our community, our kids, our teachers, all of our staff might help us um, be able to imagine what we what we can't currently see in front of us. Thank you, Mia. Anybody else have some final thoughts? Just, um, if you don't mind, I'm going to open it up. If Bethy, you wanted to make a comment, but just try to keep it brief. I'm good. Okay. So, I mean, we can have um, a little bit of time to after Libby's presentation to debrief as well. So if, so this is not your last opportunity if you're, if you're holding on to a thought and you want to say it later. Um, but I'm going to turn it over to Libby and let her do her presentation now. Emma, do you want to um, screen share the screen share what I sent to you? Because I can't, can't screen share it. Yes, give me just a second to open it up. So while Emma is pulling this up, um, Emma sent me questions that she wanted me to answer. She wanted me to address the committee's charge as well as answer some questions from the committee. Thank you. Um, let me go from the beginning though. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I, did right, look, I looked through it. <laughs> <laughs> so this is what um, Emma sent for me to answer tonight um, for the committee. And here's the outline. So speak to the committee's charge. This, the charge specifically is in these categories, the district's primary safety concerns, the historic and current role of the SRO, major successes of the SRO, challenges and other concerns of the SRO, and evaluation of the position. And then she asked me to answer some questions from the committee and um, I hope to have time to answer any, any free question and answers that the committee might have at the very end. Um, so the first one, going straight down the line, uh, safety concerns from the district. So one of the things that I really wanted to um, put out to everybody is this Venn diagram. Based on some of the comments that I've heard in public comment, as well as um, some other notes and things and requests of the school board, um, I wanted to make sure that there is a there was an understanding of the difference between SEBL, which is social emotional behavior learning, and safety planning. Those two things are very different, which is why they have different circles here. Um, so, in social emotional learning, we have um, significant amount of staff staff that I think I heard Eliana refer to um, earlier. It's over a million dollars worth of um, staff professional learning dedicated to SEBL work. 
Uh, none of the none of that staff would be considered the, the SRO. This is all school staff and school responsibility. We have significant professional learning going on right now in trauma and resiliency what, with Joelle Van Lent um, and Dave Melnick, both are psychologists, well-known psychologists of Vermont who work in trauma and resiliency in schools and with kids in the field. Our teachers um, use their contracted PD funds to often in trauma-informed mindfulness practices, all kinds of things. I signed a few just today, actually. Um, of teachers going to classes and coursework around these areas of mental health for, for supports for students. We also have a partnership with Up for Learning uh, with my friend Lindsay Hellman. And the, there's a school board presentation, which um, I'll make sure you get the link for this slideshow if Emma doesn't show it, but that, that, that's linked to a school board presentation that Lindsay did with Lisa Noss, some students. This is the other guidance counselor at the high school, um, as well as with Allie the social worker at the um, middle school on December 18th last year, almost a full year ago, um, around the beginning of the restorative practices work at Main Street Middle School and Montpelier High School and where they currently were. That work has gotten derailed a little bit because of COVID-19. Um, however, work has gotten underway and we do have a partnership with Lindsay and Up for Learning. I think I also linked their website there. Um, and in curriculum development, we have a SEL coach, a social emotional learning coach who has truly worked with the district over the last two years in our SEBL teams in building prioritized vertically articulated standards so that our cons we are more consistent with our behavior standards across the district. We have a district-wide SEBL team and each school has a SEBL group, a team inside of it. So leaders go to the district group and then come back and work with the school-based group. And we have dedicated staff meeting time to SEBL um, issues. And then we also have outside counseling. I spoke to the board last night about this. There's free space at MSMS and MHS for outside counselors to come and perform counseling services to kids if they need it during the school day. That's safe um, and quiet in their own space. Uh, UES has a connection to what I, mean, what I mean by open slots there is there's a connection to outside counselors that we can we only refer parents to counselors who have open slots so that parents don't need to run all around the, the communities trying to find slots for their kids when they're, when they're in need of that. Um, so the district has a considerable frame going for SEBL learning. Um, and, and there's nothing in there that works with the SRO. That's all district work. Um, that's the work we need to do because we have kids in our and that we, that we care about and we take care of. And then the other side of the Venn diagram is their safety planning. It's our emergency responses. So when something is desperately wrong um, th that we also need to handle and work through. And this is where um, we rely quite heavily with Montpelier Police Department and our relationship with them, as well as um, we have since this year relied with our relationship with our SRO. Um, and that's not glorifying that position in any way. That's just saying that's what we have. That's the system we've relied on for the last 10 years. And that really has to do with our safety planning. It's preparedness, mitigation, and response. It's the high priority hazards. So severe weather, weather active shooters, um, armed gunman on campus, which we had a couple of years ago, uh, custody, significant custody threats where um, kidnapping is a, is a problem you know, the high priority pieces that we can't handle by ourselves. Uh, we need the Montpelier Police Department and other people to work with us to help um, our families and our kids in these situations. Uh, we have our roles and responsibilities clearly delineated in our emergency safety plan book um, between what the MPD's role is, what the district's role is, who we call, what do we expect. Uh, we have threat assessment guidelines that we follow. Uh, we rely heavily on our colleagues at the Montpelier Police Department to guide us through threat assessments because that's their level of expertise, not schools. Uh, we have evacuation plans and the Montpelier Police Department as well as the Montpelier Fire Department um, are very well versed in what our evacuation plans are because they will need to be there should we need to evacuate. We have lockdown drills as part of the safety planning and the background check process, which we, MPD just helps us out along with other police departments to do our background checks, wherever people can go and get a slot for that. And then these circles do interact um, in safety threats, our mental health and our, our, co our colleagues at the MPD do interact with safety threats sometimes. If there's crime, significant crimes on cap campus, um, significant substance abuse, theft, that kind of thing, 
well, then we that that's an interaction. Um, sexual harassment is a big one in this day and age and on social media in particular, stalking between kids, uh, grooming behaviors, that kind of thing. We need, we need other people to come in to help us with that. Uh, right now we have truancy and home visits as been spoken to before um, and the school district safety team, the school and district, sorry, safety teams. The SRO does play a role in that, which, which also plays a role in our SEBL work. So while they do interact, there are clear um, responsibilities for the district and SEBL, and then there's clear responsibilities for safety and emergency planning. So I just wanted to, this, this type, as I, was, as I was thinking about this presentation, putting a Venn diagram out there helped me kind of clarify roles, or helped me as I was thinking about how to clarify these two pieces um, of perhaps a similar pie, but very different roles and responsibilities. So Emma, you can keep going, did I lose you? Oh no, you're still here. <laughs> All right, so this slide was shown last night um, in terms of how much we currently spend on social emotional behavior learning financially. Um, so it's um, $1.1 million. And then on the other, the flip side for safety and emergency response, we spend $92,333 currently. This is the $92,000 for fiscal year 21 is less than what we have budgeted for fiscal year 22 because we've already taken out a significant portion of the SRO from that budget. Go ahead. Em. All right, the next part is committee charge. Um, some of you have heard this before um, and there's, I apologize for the wordiness of these slides. I don't generally like that much wordiness. Um, however, it's wh what it is. So just historically, we've had an SRO for 12 years. It started as a partnership with the DARE program in 1992 because there was a significant, um, there was a significant substance abuse problem noted at the high school. The problem didn't show any influence or the program, the DARE program didn't show the influence. So the SRO started. We've had three people hold this position in the last 12 years. Primarily the SRO has been housed at Montpelier High School, but has worked in all three Montpelier schools as well as helped when we merged with Roxbury. Um, I've been out to Roxbury more than a few times with Matt Nisley in particular. The majority of the SRO time is spent at the high school with MS, MS being second to that. And the MOU that you're referring to um, was written several years ago prior to anyone working for either organization. Um, in fact, when people started coming to the school board, that was the first time I had even seen the, that MOU and it's not signed currently by I, I don't even think it's signed by any administration in the district or over at the, the um, police department, or at least I haven't seen one that's signed. <laughs> so it's not, <laughs> I can see it's not signed. So I think it was just something that somebody had on file somewhere. Um, what has shifted? Uh, so I, I actually um, asked Matt about this so because he would have the most knowledge of what has shifted <clears throat> when the SRO position came in. Uh, and in 2009, there was a shared social worker between MSMS MS and MHS. In 2010, the district added the social worker to UES. And then in 2016, a social worker was in each Montpelier building. So there's three full-time FTEs. And for our social work, we actually have four now with our district emotional learning coach. Uh, the SRO was one before all the social work came in, historically connected to families, to outside resources. Uh, but now social workers do that. The SRO was did not, did not do that. That's the social worker's primary responsibility. And um, social workers can be true counselors now. Um, go ahead, Emma. This, this bullet list here is currently what the SRO does. Um, it's very small writing, I apologize. <laughs> Try to get it all on one slide. Um, however, the, the committee had, did ask me what is the exact current role of the SRO. This is the exact thing that the, the, the SRO did up until this school year. And Libby, I just wanna let you know that I did put a link to the slide okay. In, okay. in the um, spreadsheet that was shared in the chat. It's under the Superintendent Bone Steel tab at the bottom. Okay, good. So everybody can go in and, uh, and read these, these pieces. And, and putting this up there does not mean that we can't build a system um, without an SRO, of course we can. Um, there, that's not a question. And it's, and it's not a question that other districts do it successfully as well. Um, nobody is questioning that. 
but the, the committee has asked me what the current responsibilities are and there they are um, listed out. So go ahead, Emma. So the major successes of the SRO position, um, according to old, old youth risk youth behavior survey, because we haven't gotten new ones yet, um, drug and alcohol use has shown a significant decline in the past 12 years. This also mirrors national trends. Over 12 years, two students have been taken out of MHS in handcuffs. Several cases have been diverted to restorative justice and kept out of the court system. In the past three years, anecdotally, numerous families have reported how the SRO helped mitigate emotionally trying situations regarding custody battles, sexual assault, predator-like behaviors, weapons, drug use, that kind of thing. And uh, there's a strong relationship between the former SRO and school administrators, staff, and students. Some evidence of this is the SRO is, would often be the first point of contact when significant safety threats were made. Social workers felt safe making home visits with the SRO. Administration could contact the SRO via text and get an instant response if needed. Those are all anecdotal and I recognize that. It's hard to quantify successes in this case um, because we don't collect data in this fashion. Um, challenges or other concerns regarding the SRO from the district's position, um, from the district's knowledge base. Uh, we've never had, you've talked about formal complaints, we've never had a complaint brought to the district around the SRO. I did check in with my predecessor who was at the district for seven years and he never heard a complaint either. Um, now again, anecdotal, but that's what he reported to me. Um, the board meeting in July marked the first concerns for voice to the district. The evaluation of this position is, is done by the chief of police. It's not in the district's hands, so I can't speak to the evaluation of this position. Uh, without the position, uh, MRPS leadership and the MPD will figure out, and we will, <laughs> will figure out how to build a trusting relationship with multiple officers. I think Amanda spoke to that, um, spoke to that a little bit earlier. Emma, you're confusing me here. There we go. Um, but because it's my understanding that if we have an event that we need an officer to respond to, that the person who responds will be dependent on who is, in, who is on duty and who's available at that time. Um, we will need to figure out how to communicate when major events happen within families outside of school hours. That's something Amanda spoke to as well. Um, we're gonna have to ensure that MPD support, ensure the support is there during large events or evacuations and I'm positive it would be. Um, however, what probably wouldn't happen that we would have to consider more as a district are the multiple planning meetings that happen before large scale protests that our students take part in um, or just community takes part in on our, on our campus. Um, our former SRO played a significant role in the student interaction and in planning those events, particularly when they were student led, much like the Black Lives Matter flag raising, the implementation of those plans. So the SRO was the point person between us and the, the, um, the PD and then just traffic in general during evacuations. The SRO knows our evacuation routes um, very well. Uh, that's part of their job to know them. And so when those evacuations need to happen, he could easily place officers in areas that we needed them. So we just have to ensure how to do that differently. Um, we'd also, from a district lens, we'd have to figure out how to monitor social media and other sources for threats against the district. We'd have to perform, figure out how to perform residency or well person checks and home visits. Um, I'm going to say as a superintendent, this isn't going to happen without um, some presence with them. Be, uh, may, so it just may not happen, which is, which is just a choice. Um, access appropriate supports when a student breaks the law, potentially increasing in court appearances for students. It's a potential. We can figure out how to do tr truancy and family court liaison duties. Um, and continue preventative patrols around school grounds. Again, that would be very much like the first one and be the person who's on duty and if they're available. And then train MRPS for significant safe, this is emergency situations, which we're mandated to do by the Agency of Education. So those are just things that we'd figure out and we would. Um, certain questions from the committee that I didn't think were answered there. Um, so how many incidents per year is the SRO involved in? There's no real, real way to determine this through district data sources. So I think Chief Pete gave probably the best data that you could see around um, how many times 
uh, an SRO responds. I do want to say about that data based on MS charts that all of the alarms that are going off are most likely alarms that our staff member has set off because they came in and didn't turn the alarm off. And so whenever that happens, the MPD responds and anybody who's on would respond to that. So my hunch is from that one chart of all the different officers and their responses may directly correlate to the number of alarms that our staff sets off. Sorry, Chief Pete, <laughs> it happens though. Um, how is data around the SRO collected and reported? Can we have access to it? We don't collect data on our team members. So I could no more give you um, data around how, how, um, how is data collected and reported around our social workers or our guidance counselors than I could around our SRO. They've been a member of the team. So we just don't collect data in that way. We have data on students. Um, and, but we also have a very small end size in that data. Um, and at this board level committee, we can't identify, um, I think I heard Will talking about earlier, it's hard to, hard to put that data out there and not be identifiable. Um, but I did um, put five years of MHS suspension data in this, and there's a link to that, um, along with demographic data as well. How often is the SRO used as a resource to the school? It, it truly depends on the situation at hand, and slide nine is the how the SRO is currently used. Um, so you can access that, uh, that slide. How many students have, from traditionally marginalized groups have been involved with the SRO to their detriment? I'm not sure how to answer that question um, because I am not from that traditionally marginalized group and we don't have data about detrimental effects of, of people responding. Um, I, don't, I don't know how I would answer that question. Um, so that, that was hard for me. Um, when the SRO is utilized to interview with incidents involving student behaviors or actions, how often does it result in either restorative practices or referral to the criminal justice system? Um, it depends on the behaviors and the actions. If the behaviors and the actions is against the law, we work with, we have traditionally worked with the SRO. And like I said earlier, twice in 10 years um, has uh, situations gone to the court system. Uh, we are currently building our capacity with restorative practices. So again, it's, there's not like there's a, there's a chart where it's here's the incident and check it goes to restorative practices, check it goes to restorative justice or check it goes to the court system. It's just not how we've collected data over the years. So we don't have that type of information. What are the current safety protocols? Again, it depends for an intruder or threatening violence at the school. It again, it depends on the situation. Um, we had a threatening parent in the beginning of the year at Main Street Middle School. And the principal simply said outside of the building, you are making me feel unsafe. I'm leaving and going in the building now. And that's what happened. Um, and so that that was a threatening parent to that, to that principal. There was a lot of cursing, a lot of violent language, and the principal just left the situation. Um, there's been other times where we had um, an individual who was driving around our parking lot this fall and watching practices on a daily basis from their car, um, which was just curious for, the, for our school system. So we asked the police if they could check, check into that a little bit because um, we weren't sure. So it really depends on the situation. Um, at hand, there is not one protocol that is followed because kids are different, families are different, um, situations are different. Go ahead. What measures of accountability are in place? Again, that's a question for Chief Pete because uh, by law, I believe, but the chief could, could correct me on this. The chief of police is the only person who is able to evaluate um, other police officers. Uh, do school personnel see the SRO as living up to the job description? I don't want to speak for my colleagues, but from the one, the school personnel who I have spoken with, yes, the SRO has lived up, to, lived up to the expectations set in our system. Could the SRO be present in schools without a firearm? Again, that's a question for Chief Pete, and I think he's been pretty clear on that. Does it have to be the SRO who follows us on truancy issues? No, many schools don't use an SRO for that. We can de develop a different process. How can the community support their police department's ongoing training? Say that would be a conversation that you'd wanna have with the chief and the department. What are the current rules and protocols for the SRO's presence on school grounds? Currently, the board has directed me that the SRO is not on school grounds unless we ask her to be because of a significant safety need, which we've had about five all this year. However, all emergency personnel, police, fire, uh, all emergency personnel have access to our buildings and can enter it whenever they need to. 
um, because we need to do that for emergency situations. If the SRO is in the building about half the time, how are they developing relationships with students? Um, I would say from my observations of the position in former years, um, the SRO was visible in the hallways, they were talking to kids, they were eating lunch in the cafeteria with kids, they were working with various student groups, that kind of thing. Um, and that's how relationships were built. Um, so I believe I got to all the committee's answers or questions, but I'm happy to take other questions from the committee. Hey, Emma. Oh, there. Yeah, if you want to um, do the raise hand function, I can look at that, um, but we can start with Mia. Did, is that you, Mia? Yeah, I wasn't sure if you wanted to kick it to Edie or Eliana as, as the co-vice chairs, if your camera is off, but no. Hey, you're back. Hi. Hi. Um, and I do have a question, So, but I also have been talking a lot, so I would don't mind. Looks like Zach has his hand raised and Joan does, so I can wait my turn. Okay, we'll go to Zach first. Yeah, so been, Hey Zach, um, your microphone is, is pretty garbled. Zach, do you mind typing your question into the chat just because your microphone is pretty garbled? Um, yeah. Yes. Okay, sorry, it's not ideal, but um, it's okay. pretty hard to hear. Um, just for the sake of time, let's have Joan uh, ask your question and then when Zach types his question in, then we'll answer that one. Okay. Um, thanks, Libby, for preparing that presentation. Now I'm looking for your words to you go. Um, I'm trying to look at your box. Thanks for preparing that presentation. I wanted to follow up on your, um, in the list of um, tasks, it was a slide about tasks that would have to be like handled differently if there was not an SRO. The one about um, doing home visits, um, it sounded like you were pretty definitive that without um, Montpelier Police Department presence or accompaniment, just home visits would not happen. I think I heard you say that. Could you just elaborate on that a bit? And I'm sort of thinking about earlier in the meeting, you know, we had a report from other schools that don't have an SRO, how they handle home visits. So I, I just, I want to hear more of your perspective of why that would be a d definite, not something that just wouldn't happen without police participation. I've heard pretty clearly from my social workers and they could correct me, but I've heard pretty clearly that they don't feel safe doing it. Um, and I'm not gonna ask a, one of my people who are on teacher contracts to do something that they're, they don't feel safe doing it. They've referenced the shooting of the social worker at DCF a few, a few years ago to me. Um, there's, some, there's some legitimate reasons there um, that, that I, don't, I don't, I would not force them to do that. If they didn't want to, if they felt more, com if they felt comfortable going with another colleague, then we could have some conversations about that. Um, but I wouldn't, I would not make them do that as part of their job if they didn't feel comfortable with it. Yeah, thanks. All right, um, Zach, you have not typed your question in yet. Oh, <laughs> okay. Um, so I'm going to pass it off to Mia real quick, and then maybe oh, we can try again. There's that. Zach. My mine's actually related to Joan, so if I if I may, I and I thought I heard Amanda say earlier in the meeting that the colleagues she talked spoke with would do home visits, um, but I so I definitely want to get corrected because I don't want to leave this meeting having a. I also um, want to make clear that that's an operational decision. That's not a board's decision. Uh, I agree. So, so regardless of whether they would or they wouldn't, that's something that we would work out inside the school system. Yep. Yep. And that totally makes sense. And I, I think the reason that I wanted to raise it here, one, was because I'm hearing two different things. And part of what we're, we, we're trying to get a whole lot of information and the clarity around the information would be very helpful. And I don't want to leave thinking two different things. So I wanted to get that clarity, one, 
it, and it feels like this is another example of the the work that we have to do to imagine what we aren't currently in and that it is it's it's hard to imagine that and and safety is absolutely in, uh, imperative yes and i appreciate you libby tossing out an idea that if it was two colleagues going instead of one social worker and a police officer like that's a good example of here this is my how we might rethink this um so anyway my question was mostly just to get that clarity and also to use this as a i think a really good example of how this is exactly what we're wrestling with. We are imagining a system that we haven't had in over a decade. We're imagining something different. Mia, to, be, to just clarify, there was one social worker who wasn't comfortable and one who said she would be more comfortable. So they just, there's yeah. just different opinions. Yep, yep, absolutely. Very, very difficult um, situation to be in. I get it. And so thank you for that clarification, Amanda. Okay, so... Oh, Libby, did you, was there more that you wanted to respond to that? I'm sorry. No, I'm just reading Zach's question. Okay, so Zach's question is, as part of the project that he's working on, I'm looking at how the police department interacts with students when a crime has been committed within the school, specifically in relationship to sexual assault. And my understanding was that it isn't always the SRO involved and is more of a police department problem. So I'm wondering if there is anything that the SRO does in conjunction with the department like DCF that would differ from the job of a normal police officer? Might be a better question for Chief Pete than for me. Yeah, <laughs> That's a great question. Time. That's a great question, Zach. Um, and um, what I can say is that if a sexual assault occurred, and Chief, correct me if I'm wrong on this protocol from your understanding, but in the past, if a sexual assault had occurred and the school was the ones who found out or the person the kid reported it to the school, either to somebody like Amanda or, or um, Aliyah or somebody at the high school or, or middle school, then our first call would be to the SRO um, in that situation if we needed police support in the situation. And if we're talking about sexual harassment we, or sexual assault, we most likely would need support because that's a crime. Um, but Chief Pete, I'm not sure if you wanna, if you wanna speak to the department's piece of that? What we would probably do, so the department does have a strong have a partnership with external stakeholders. So in a case like this, especially if it involves youth and juvenile, um, that the SRO might be able, so, so the student may have warmth with the SRO, may have developed a situation in which they have trust and, and a strong relationship with the SRO. So they may divulge this or they've gone, gone through other channels. So um, if that's the case, we want to minimize as much contact or conversation about this as possible. So um, if, if this was something that was reported to school staff, school staff could relay that to the SRO. The SRO could in turn um, connect with us, uh, connect back with the detectives, and the detectives would continue on that from there. So um, uh, for something that serious, an SRO is not, you know, um, th they're not going to run the lead on that case. That's something that's going to be done by the de detectives because they have the formalized training and everything else and the time to conduct those. That's their realm. So it would move on to a detective. The detective would coordinate with the state's attorney's office, with uh, do child forensic interviewing, for example, and then uh, work the case to that effect. So, so I would say that the SRO at that particular point in time, there may be information that the 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 detectives cannot share with members of uh, of the school staff that they can possibly let the SRO know, and the SRO can forward that information. Um, in, in a delicate manner, not, not the specific information, but kind of give some advice or some guidance as to what um, that family or that, uh, that child is dealing with to help foster, you know, to help rally around for a more holistic, more holistic approach um, for what's best for that student. Thank you. Um, Jay, you have a question? I do. Um, I'm curious, uh, Libby and Brian, your thoughts on, can the SRO position function significant, significantly if it's not full-time? Could it be a half-time or um, could it be structured differently and still be successful? Um, I know so much of the success is based around relationships, but I'm just curious on your thoughts around that. Do you think you want to give it a go? Yeah. 
Yeah, I'm sorry. Yes, yes, sir. Uh, I can take a, a stab at that one first. Um, so basically, I, my, the short answer to that one is probably going to be no. Uh, we, we would not be able to, uh, you know, if we have one person specifically designated to to the school system, it, it's, you know, because of because of the ebb and flow of our of our personnel, our work hours, the shifts and everything else to that effect, it's it would just probably be impossible to have one person who would do like a part time uh, for that position that that's going to be something extremely difficult to do. Uh, and, and if it's a, then the other part of it is that, that, you know, the SRO is not a counselor. The SRO is, a, is, is trained in those types of things to, to do warm handoffs or to make sure that we don't escalate any situations. Uh, no one's, uh, you know, I, I would never advocate that the SRO is to replace a counselor. Uh, but I think that the more understanding and training that they have, the, the easier it is to, to humanize and to, to come into very delicate situations um, with a very restorative justice uh, and, and soft hand to go to it. But with, with um, uh, again, and, and if an SRO was like a part-time, I, I would not see the, the, t the amount of time they would have to be there at the school to develop those relationships. There are some kids that may have um, an affinity away from police officers, understood, but there are some that may gravitate to them as well. And to me, it's it's one of those things that the majority of layers that you have in there to uh, to help somebody or to identify a potential problem uh, is, is better off for the, uh, for, the, for the students. Thank you. Um, I have a question uh, around, so the two schools that I spoke to, um, they talked about a lot of frustration around truancy and how it really doesn't go anywhere and that the state doesn't prosecute and that they can't remember a case that ever went to the courts. So there's been some talk about the SRO role being um, sort of an advocate through the process of truancy court and stuff like that. And I was just wondering, Libby, what has your experience been with like actually having to rely on that process. Has the state's attorney prosecuted truancy cases in Montpelier? No, Boston? no, they don't do anything with truancy. doesn't matter if we have an SRO or not. <laughs> um, it's letters. And then we do a CSP, which is a, a crisis support plan, which generally the, the SRO has been a part of because it's, it's lots of community members um, coming to be a part of that if we need to. And it, truancy, we, there is no consequence for truancy. As a principal, when I was principal in Essex, I spent um, one day every month pregnant, sitting on long wooden pews at, at, in Burlington court system with one case of a, of a kid who, who, whose mom refused to send him to school. He had missed like 65 days of school as a second grader and nothing was done. The, the judge told her to turn an alarm on to get him to school. It, it there isn't anything that happens to, with truancy and it's not the MPD and it's not police department's faults and it's not the school district's fault. It just, there's no follow through. And I don't believe they have the personnel to follow through or a true understanding of what they should do for consequence for, for parents and guardians. That was the same sentiment of the schools that I spoke to. It's a really frustrating it piece. It doesn't have teeth. Um, yeah. So the other question I had was around in-house restorative justice practices. And I know you talked a little bit about it in your presentation, but one of the examples that Will wrote into the um, spreadsheet around people's anecdotal experiences with the SRO um, surrounded a, a senior prank that happened in this over the summertime or at the end of last school year. Um, last school year? Yeah, this past school year, there was some kids that broke into the school and the alarm was set and the police ended up taking those kids and work going through the community justice center. Um, that was five years ago. No, no, it was this year. I can talk to you privately about it, um, but it was at the Montpelier High School and it was it was like five or six kids this year. So in June, in June of 2020. Um, and the, the um, question was from the parent who shared the story, it was about you know, confusion around like, when does the threshold, when is the threshold met? And they were thinking like the threshold was met because the alarm was tripped. And so the police officer was the first respondent to the scene. But I'm just wondering like in-house, does the principal have sort of authority to decide when they institute um, in-house restorative justice practices versus going through the police and the community justice center? Yeah, yeah, that'd be an administrative call. All right, any other questions? <sighs> 
So there's been a lot of inf information processed at this meeting. Um, and I appreciate everybody's attention span and everybody's input and all the work that went into gathering all that information. I do think um, we're probably gonna wanna do a little bit of homework between now and the next meeting, which I think um, we scheduled. Let me just look at my calendar for, it looks like we're gonna do every other Tuesday starting with Tuesday, January 12th. So you can sort of pencil that into your calendars and then I'll get back to you with an agenda for the 12th. Um, but between now and the 12th, I know that there's a few articles that were given to us. I'm not sure if um, Sue and Keisha, I think Sue is still on the call, but I'm not sure if Sue and Keisha, our facilitators have, um, there she is, have uh, put together a comprehensive sort of list of, of the articles that they want us to read between now and the next meeting. But there's some articles um, there's also the feedback. It would be nice if you read all of the feedback that was provided in that spreadsheet. Um, Mia, you had mentioned a couple of other things that we might want to do between now and, and the 12th. And I can put this together in a comprehensive email and send it to you as I usually do, sort of the yeah. homework. Much appreciated for the email in advance. <laughs> Appreciations in advance, Emma, for that email. Um, I also wanted to note that Julia Schaefitz um, noted in the chat that she'd like to make a public comment. Just wanted to make sure you didn't miss that, Emma. Okay. Yeah, I'm looking at public at uh, the chat right now. So also um, Libby's slides, your the permission sharing um, needs to be changed to view if, if that is possible for people with the link to be able to view. And um, I'll hold public comment to the end. I did want to do just a quick... Um, I know I'm sorry that I'm trying to like stick to the agenda and get us to end on time because like so much of this conversation I think requires, you know, a lot of depth and I wish that we had more time to sort of sit with everybody's uh, conversations that they had within the past week and a half and I would love to have, you know, often when I call people individuals on on this um, committee I end up talking to them for like 45 minutes to an hour and a half. <laughs> And I know that happened with Chief Pete on a Saturday morning. I was looked at the clock and then it was like, oh my gosh, we've been talking for an hour and a half. So I, we can go really deep on this stuff and I, and I wish that we had more time, but I do want to honor um, you know, your time commitment and that everybody has personal lives outside of this committee. And Joan even attended on her birthday last time. So um, what I'd like to do is just go through um, the committee members really quick and just you know, sort of closing thoughts takeaways, just a quick, um, you know, one or two sentences. So I'll just go in the order that I see you visibly on the screen. So for those of you who have um, shut off your screens, I'll try to get to you at the end, or if you want to turn on your screen for this part, that would be great. Um, so Amanda. Um, yeah, I'm just sitting with re-envisioning like what this could look like. I don't have anything specific, just like, yeah, sorry, I'm, I'm pretty fried, but <laughs> that's kind of what I'm sitting with. <laughs> All right, um, Catherine. I concur with the fried <laughs> uh, position in my brain right now, but um, I think that with all of this, you know, centrally, we want to do what's best for the kids. And it's definitely looking like some, uh, some things need to be adjusted. Um, consistency needs to be, you know, and accountability need to be forefront. Um, and I just have great concern for kids who will slip through the cracks. And, um, you know, if we don't have a good plan going forward. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Um, Will? Um, mostly thanks for everybody. I mean, this is, this is hard, um, but it does some sort of update and um, some renewal of shared understanding um, certainly seems to be necessary. Um, 
and I mean, mostly what I've said already is that, that that memo really is terrible. The one that isn't unsigned and nobody knows where it came from. It's terrible. Um, but it's the standing agreement. And it's in my head, it is looming as just the perfect metaphor for why this work is necessary and why we have to we have to renew that understanding in a way that is actually shared and signed and clear and to to the benefit of all parties. Thank you. Uh, Mia? Um, I mostly want to say again, thank you very much to um, my fellow committee members, uh, say thank you to Chief Pete and to Superintendent Bonesteel for engaging in the conversation. And, um, you know, we, we, it's not like we have a whole lot of free time on our hands, but I did want to just offer the invitation to have more conversation um, on this um, topic. And as we wrestle with these, as, as you all are going through the information and thinking what, what is possible, what isn't possible, just reach out, um, shoot me an email. I'd be happy to grab a cup of tea virtually with you and, and talk this through as we continue to wrestle with it. So I wanted to extend that invitation to anybody on the committee and anybody listening. Joan? Um, yeah, I thought it was great to just have, even though it was a cursory um, overview of all of the different um, information and perspectives that were shared from you know various stakeholders, including from, I, I found it, um, really useful to have some of the information about from experts and other schools to have alongside like what folks in our own community from students to parents to staff um, have experienced. And um, there's a lot to digest between now and January 12th. Um, so, and, um, and I'm, I think gonna be really be sitting with how to, um, how to really, uh, weigh the experiences, especially of um, students, families, parents, caregivers, um, of folks who have uh, traditionally been at the margins and edges of, um, of our community and how that fits in with this big picture. Thank you. Pierre? I also want to echo what everyone else is saying. Um, I think there's been a lot of hurt in this community, um, just like nationally. Um, but I always go back to like, number one, we're doing this for the kids. So I always say it's not about you, it's not about me, it's about we. Like, what are we doing for this community? Um, so I think that this is the start of that. I, I think that we have to make sure we have conversations that are focused on making good changes for the kids uh, and the students of our community. But we have to have conversations in a way that's productive. So thank you very much for the work. Thanks. Um, Eliana? Um, I thought this meeting was really valuable because we could see like the clear um, responsibilities of the SRO and like how, how we can go about like fulfilling them, not necessarily with the SRO. I feel like our past meetings have been good, but it was, we ne really needed to get to this point of seeing like um, the specifics of, of the position. Thank you. Jay? Um, yeah, I'll, you know, I'm thankful for everybody's time and, and all these thoughts. I'll just uh, um, emphasize what Eliana just said, which I really appreciate that. I think tonight's uh, conversation was really valuable hearing from um, Superintendent Bonesteel and, and Chief Pete around um, the real practical applications of the SRO um, and I look forward to um, how those conversations continue and how we, how we balance between um, uh, how the district can, can manage that position and also how we're, we're looking also at a, at a broader picture at the same time. So thanks. Thank you. So I'm gonna call on some people who have their video off, but um, you know, if you're in a space where you're not comfortable talking, that's okay. Um, Edie? You're muted. Okay, sorry. Um, I, a lot of what I'm feeling has been said 
by people. So I just want to echo a lot of that. I think Eliana uh, was right about this meeting being really valuable. I learned and it was learning that I uh, had had to do in order to feel um, more comfortable in the position of committee member as someone responsible for um, taking part in making a recommendation about what to do. Um, and also my brain is very fried. Um, so that's, and thank you to everyone here. Um, Zach? Zach made a public or a chat. Um, sorry about your mic. I don't know. Maybe we can get you an external mic. <laughs> um, just because my mic is being glitchy, I think it was very useful to hear and see the statistics as well as hear professional anecdotes or personal anecdotes on experiences individuals had. Re-envisioning or reimagining how policing looks within our community is a difficult subject, but extremely important to talk about. And huge thanks to everyone here. Thank you, Zach. Um, I'm looking through to see if any other committee members have their cameras off and it doesn't look like you do. So yeah, same with Edie. I just sort of echo everything that everybody said and I, and I keep coming back to gratitude for, you know, this is a, an emotional and potentially political conversation. It's, you know, um, it's intense, it can be intense, but it feels really, really important. And what I've seen from everyone here is just like such a um, dedication and commitment to this community and the students in the community and, um, and, and kind of rolling up your shirt sleeves and digging into this work. And at a time when, you know, winter is upon us and holiday season is upon us and COVID is upon us and, you know, there's so many other stressors out there for everybody to be taking the time out of the, out of your lives like this. And it's, it, I think it just says a lot about our community. So, um, a wealth of appreciation. I do want to quickly open it up um, for public comment again and just try to keep public comment brief. I think it was Julia who had um, your hand raised and I don't know if there's anybody else that's wanting to speak. Um, thanks for the opportunity, uh, appreciate it. Um, and I just wanted to underscore what um, Eliana said and then a bunch of people um, echoed. It was really helpful to see laid out um, from the, from Libby, the roles of the SRO and what, what, what would need to happen in order for a placement to happen. Um, and I just really want to encourage you all, uh, first of all, to keep students in the center. Um, I absolutely, um, think staff safety is, is, is paramount and important. Um, but the, the, the initial decisions need to be from, from student centered places. And then we figure out how to keep the staff staff um, safe. And I say this as a social worker, as somebody who does go into homes, has gone into homes um, of clients. And I think it's really, I just, I think that's uh, just really important to kind of center the needs of the students first. Um, I also think there's a lot of nuance in terms of um, home visits and, and in terms of understanding where a family's at, where a student is at, that, you know, maybe there is not a blanket statement in terms of how a district handles something. And I would really encourage uh, the district and the committee to continue to be really creative with solutions to this, uh, it, you know, as if and when um, replacement is is looked at, or even updating the systems. Um, and one thing I just really wanted to point out is that on, on the bottom of the Venn diagram, just sort of to highlight the creativity that can happen, um, the Venn diagram that Libby shared. Um, one of the items was that the that the that UES is having a connection with outside therapists. Um, that's actually a, pro a project of the uh, UES Caregivers Alliance. It's now been expanded to all of the schools in MRPS, um, and it's cost nothing. It's been an initiative that's totally been run by parents um, who are also therapists, um, and connection with the social workers um, at UES, and then now spread to the other ones. And it's a great example of how we can really creatively use our resources in this community to meet some needs um, 
and to uh, to really think outside the box of what's already exam- of what's already what's what's already happening. It's something that we've been told couldn't happen and wasn't doable, and then we figured out how to do it. So I just really want to make sure that you all are sort of keeping in mind the ways to think outside the box. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. Uh, um, do any of the other members of the public want to speak briefly before we adjourn? Okay, do I have, um, so I'll be sending out an email with the homework before and then just uh, highlight on your calendar, pencil in um, the 12th and the 26th of January and, and hopefully every other Tuesday we can sort of plan on that. Do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Do I have a second? I'll second okay. it. Okay, Amanda? You were muted, Amanda, but uh, we'll move on to Catherine. Hi, sorry. Oh. Hi. Will? Hi. Mia? Hi. Joan? Hi. Jay? Hi. Pierre? Hi. Edie? Hi. Zach? Hi. All right, thank you so much. Happy holidays, everyone. Take good care. Happy New Year. Bye. Take care, everyone. Nice to see you. Hi. Hey, Emma. Nice job. Thank you. I'm going to.